Welcome. I'm Carl Frederick, and I will be interviewing individuals for Kenosha Voices, an oral history project of the Kenosha County Historical Society in conjunction with Kenosha Community Media. I have worked in newspapers for more than 40 years as an editor and a reporter. 38 and a half of those years were at the Kenosha News. I am also a member of the Kenosha County Historical Society Board. We hope you enjoy these programs. I'm speaking with Bob Lichter, a former employee of Peter Persh and Sons, a company known worldwide for its assembly and manufacture of firefighting apparatus and vehicles. Hello, Bob. Hi, Carl. Now, um, <clears throat> I understand that you worked for the company uh, from when to when, I guess. I did. I started working at uh, Peter Pearson Sons in February of 1971. Um, it was about halfway through my senior year of high school. I turned 18 in February, and my father was an employee there. He worked there for 45 years. And at that time, um, their work day was uh, 7 a.m. to 5.30 p.m. And he asked me, well, what time do I get out of school? And I said, 2.30. He said, okay, well, you can come work with me for three hours a day. So that's how I uh, got started there. And then when did you leave the company? I left just before Christmas of 1977. Okay. Can you tell me about the hiring process? Uh, you mentioned that uh, your father said, come and work with me after school. So what did you do to actually get hired? Well, in my case, uh, that's all I did was show up on a day after school and uh, my dad had made arrangements for me to work with him as a helper and um, when I graduated from high school in 1971 I went to work full-time that was my uh, some time after that so I worked full-time starting in well early in June of 1971. What was the work like? Uh, it was uh, I worked in, my dad worked in the sheet metal department it was an area where they built the bodies of the trucks. And the, uh, the trucks were all uh, custom designed and hand built. It was not an assembly line. Um, so he would have a blueprint of the truck, uh, top, side, and rear view of the truck, along with some other text. And that was used to uh, cut um, sheet metal parts, 12 gauge cold roll sheet metal. I remember all this and different angle irons and um, flat stock uh, that was cut and sanded and cleaned up and welded and prepared to uh, assemble this fire engine. Okay. So, <clears throat> what was your first day of work like? Well, my first uh, full day uh, was so, somewhat uh, overwhelming, I guess, for, a, for an 18-year-old kid not used to the working world when I was sitting on, a, sitting on a wooden box at about quarter to seven on a dark, rainy uh, Monday morning and thinking, how am I going to make it till 5.30? Uh, thinking of a long day like that. But once things got rolling on that, it, uh, it was interesting work, and I enjoyed it and um, just paid attention and learned. And Did you have any other positions with the company I while did. you were there? Uh, in, in each department, there were uh, lead, well, lead men, the job was called at the time, and a helper. So I started as a helper, and then uh, I did sp spend a couple semesters in school over the next couple years, but in 1975, I was given a lead man position. So I was responsible for the construction of the body of that truck. Did all of the departments that constructed, manufactured, built the vehicle or the apparatus, did they all have two member teams or were they different in some other department? It could be two or three or four even. Um, the uh, construction started at the north end of the shop and uh, where a crew, a three person crew would rivet uh, frame channels together and another crew would uh, put the uh, engine, drivetrain, the uh, pump and the axles onto the frame and from that point it would be rolled into a, a, a an area where the uh, the sheet metal or body building group would take over and uh, 
It was all based on a blueprint. Exactly, yeah. How was the blueprint done? I mean, who did the blueprint for the vehicle? Okay, typically um, I, I have memories of uh, the engineering people walking through the plant with a contingent from a certain city. And I remember Louisville, Kentucky, Memphis, Tennessee, Atlanta, Georgia, Chicago. Uh, it may have been uh, city officials, probably the fire chief, uh, other people, and they would take a tour of the plant. Then they would sit down with the engineer and the drafting people and just talk through what they want, the type of truck, whether it be a pumper or an aerial ladder truck, the type of engine, the type of pump piping, hose reels, hose beds, things like that. And the engineer would design it, the drafts, drafting people would draw it up, and that's where the uh, print would come from. So each vehicle was unique to whatever city's needs were when they came to draw that print. That's correct. There were really no, I'm not going to say no two trucks alike, but uh, pretty much every truck was built to that city's needs and specification. What was it like working at the plant with the other employees? I mean, you were, basically you walked in because your dad said, come on. Did the other, how did the other employees look at that? Is that how other employees were given jobs as well? Or was this kind of a unique one for you? No, there was uh, several uh, father and son crews, maybe three, four, five, half dozen at least. It just uh, sort of a family tradition type thing there was at that place. Um, I, it was a small, small group, 80 people, somewhere in the 80s uh, for those years. And I enjoyed working with the people. I was uh, treated very, very well there. My, my dad was very popular and he had a lot of friends there. So I was taken under the wing of many of the, the older employees. And I enjoyed that part of it. I enjoyed uh, the people there. Um, like my dad, a lot of these men were um, local people, uh, grew up in Kenosha during the Depre Great Depression years. Many of them had been in the service during World War II, and um, I just found, found them really compelling to work with. Uh, also, there were uh, a lot of uh, people there, uh, immigrants, European immigrants. I knew men that had been born in Italy, Germany, Poland, Yugoslavia, Lithuania, that had emigrated to the states anywhere from the 1930s, 40s, 50s. And I found that very interesting. And there was also people, because Kenosha was an industrial hub, there were, jobs were plentiful uh, during World War II years and for a couple decades after that, uh, there were men there that came from the Dakotas or the Upper Peninsula of Michigan or the Deep South. Um, Alabama, Mississippi, and I found that very interesting to work with them and to get to know them. And I think that was a common thread throughout the industry in Kenosha, that uh, a lot of immigrants and people would come from other states for the work. Um, you, as a, as a helper initially, and you talked about the uh, assembly and the, the, the bending and the welding, did you have to like work on your back? Were you always kind of standing up? I'm just, mm -hmm. you know, how well, yeah, it was typically okay. I would be maybe as a helper assigned uh, to go and cut and prepare sheet metal for maybe 30 compartment doors that would be on the truck. So I would go out to the sheet metal shear. There's a large heavy metal table loaded up with a couple of uh, four by eight sheets of said cold roll sheet metal, had a sort of a light oil on it uh, to keep it uh, from cor corroding and also uh, keep it, you could move it around a little bit, but you had to make sure you had your gloves on to be safe, safety glasses, and I would take a uh, uh, six foot folding ruler, a scratch awl for marking the metal, and uh, uh, typically a square, a uh, carpenter square, or there's a larger square, and just cut mark out uh, dimensions of the doors and cut it on the shear and then have to uh, prepare the edges, sand and file the edges so they wouldn't be sharp and um, take it from there, I guess. Uh, what kind of gloves did you use? Uh, heavy work gloves like uh, that you could buy at department stores because working with the sheet metal would get 
the edges would get very sharp and you would be concerned about getting cuts, which I did occasionally. And were there other, <clears throat> any other safety features when you were cut, were there other breaks or bars that would keep you from getting your fingers under the cut cutter? Um, on the shear and the, the sheet metal breakers, uh, there, I don't know, you just had to, you learned and you just paid attention to what you were doing with that. Uh, so. So you had room to move and. Oh yeah, you know, there was a lot of, yeah. Of the you, sheet metal and. One of the things I enjoyed about the job is there was a lot of, uh, well, there was a lot of responsibility and a lot of freedom to plan your day and um, get the job done in the most efficient way possible and safety. So, efficiency and safety. So when you were dealing with the sheet metal, were you kind of alone all of uh, the time? Or did sometimes people wander and around and It depended in? on uh, if I was cutting and bending a large piece of sheet metal for a hose bed or a uh, back step on a fire engine, then you would need a hand with that. And um, it would either be part of the crew you worked with or um, in that area where the two sheet metal brakes and two shears were, there was usually several people working and we would all give each other a hand when needed. It was very, very, a lot of teamwork there, a lot of camaraderie. What did you get paid when you were working there? Well, my starting wage in uh, February 1971 was $2.96 an hour. Which, which was good at the time? That was great for me. Um, I had left I had spent a couple years working at a little neighborhood grocery store in Kenosha. Uh, minimum wage, which I, I think that might have been a dollar ten, maybe up to a dollar forty at that time. So it was a pretty substantial raise for me. Tell me about the company, not the company itself, but tell me about the culture of the company, uh, what it was like working for uh, Peter Persh. Well, it was a, a family owned business. Uh, we were in the third generation at that time. And um, the culture, it was a, when I started, it was a positive thing. I mean, the, uh, the management would, would walk around and talk to you, and uh, there was a foreman group, uh, two foremen who would, uh, were very pleasant to work with. I mean, if you came in and, and did your job and punched in at the old time clock at the right times every day, um, Everything was good. There was a, it was a positive experience there. So did uh, Peter Purse come on the floor? Or he well, he, from what I knew from my dad, is that my dad started there in 1940. Peter Pierce died in 1954, I believe. And uh, my dad, as a young person, would always he always enjoyed his job, and he would talk about how Peter Pierce walked out, and, and he would uh, give people tickets to a boxing match in Milwaukee or uh, maybe a ball game or something. He was very, uh, very kind, seemed to be a very kind, benevolent man in his role as the owner of that company. And that lasted for as long as you yeah, were there, they, that kind of there were family things connection. changing uh, when I was there. Um, How so? Well, there were the next generation came in and um, just didn't seem to have the same um, concern about the employees. There was a little more um, okay. harder so what, feelings or something about what wages and benefits and Did things. this lead to a union or yeah, what? Well, the union, I, when I started there in February 71, there was a union, there was a union there. Uh, it was a national, Brotherhood of Independent Unions. It was not affiliated with any of the larger, like the United Auto Workers or anything. But my understanding from what my dad said was um, sometime in the late 1950s, the employees there felt that there should be a union uh, to maybe negotiate benefits and wages and help with that. So um, I don't really know the details of how the union was formed, but from a, somewhere in the late 1950s on, it was a, an independent union with a union board, union president, secretary, treasurer, and so forth. There are union dues to be paid, and the union board had negotiated a contract with, with the company management. You mentioned how you 
were welcomed by the employees and you got along with the employees while you were working there. Um, did you socialize with any of them um, after work or did the company have any way that the employees would get together and see each other? Yeah. Well, just having friends, I had a lot of friends that worked there and we did socialize very much, you know, a lot of guys went hunting or fishing together, played softball together, whatever. The company did, uh, and we had a bowling team, we had a Pierce bowling team back in the 1970s, which was fun. And also there was a, there was a Christmas party, and um, when I was a, a young boy with my dad working there, they had a, you know, somebody played Santa, and, that type of thing, and every summer there was a picnic too. They, they just call it the Pierce Beano. Um, got the grills fired up and cooked some hot dogs and hamburgers, and usually there was a softball game, uh, horseshoe games, and uh, so there was a there was good camar camaraderie there. Are there any special stories you remember while working there? Well, as I said, I I enjoyed the people. Um, I feel I learned a lot about people. And working there, you you had to be able to communicate, you had to be able to plan, you had to be able to work as a team. Um, and um, throughout that, I, getting to know the people that were, uh, had a different background in me, especially the people that came from, from the other countries, immigrants, the part of their culture. and. Um, that was very interesting to me as, as a young, young person, uh, getting to know people. That, and a lot of these cases, they were a generation or two older than me. But that was fun and interesting too, that part of it. How did you get to work? I, I drove, I, we lived about, about a mile from the plant, but I drove there, five minute drive there and back. Did you go with your dad or you drove your own car? Early on, when I was still in high school, I rode with my dad, uh, well, that first summer, and uh, being that close, uh, part of the work in that pier, she, at 7 to 5.30, there was a break. Uh, if I remember right, it was 9.20 to 9.30, a bell would ring. So you would, you would stop working and grab a cup of coffee or whatever and sit there for 10 minutes until the bell, bell rang again. And then the bell rang again at noon, 12 o'clock noon, and it and you there you had to punch out, so you had to make your plan of going to uh, near the door to the old time clock, and punch your card, and then you had to be back by 12:30 if you went out, and punch that card again. And being so close, my dad would always drive home for lunch, and my mom and dad would have lunch together, and he would drive back for and five you, minutes. And you took a lunch instead yeah, of I did, going yeah, home. Yeah, I did that, and otherwise um, sometimes brought a lunch, and, and several of the guys would sit together and talk. There were uh, places <laughs> right in across the street or down the block where you could have a sandwich or a plate lunch uh, very easily in that, that half-hour time period. But okay. you always wanted to make sure that you got back and. Uh, punched in, and when you looked at your time card, the numbers, the ink was blue, but if you missed those time slots, the ink was red, so you didn't want, you wanted to avoid uh, having any red uh, red marks on your time card. Every, when it was and how did the foreman treat that? Uh, you were... You said it was pretty automatic. You yeah, if, they, if, if, uh, if they got your time card and you had a couple of red marks in there, they would talk to you and explain how important it was to have those... Uh, to be timely with that, but um, and if uh, I never gotten to a situation where I was disciplined or anything for that, but I was, you know, you would you would be counseled, let's say, if uh, if you had a few red red spots on your time card. Is there any other th thing you'd like to say about the the employment and the time you spent? Um, which I believe was six years, 71 yeah, roughly, 77 yeah, or so. Yeah, six and a half years. I, I just have good memories. I, um, I enjoyed the work and, and being there, um, part of the culture was, was there, the people, like I said, my dad was, was always very happy working there. Uh, it was interesting work. Um, didn't make as much money as other places in Kenosha, but I think with the extra hours, 
It's like when I first started, I, I mentioned 7 to 5.30, but also it was Monday through Friday, but also they worked 7 till noon on Saturday. So the regular work week was 55 hours early Did on. that change during the it time? Did, it did. They, they dropped the Saturday, and then they went, and somewhere in the early 70s went to a nine-hour day. So it was a 7 a.m. to 4.30 p.m. Uh, day. But that always gave you a few extra bucks to compete with uh, some of the other industries in town that, that we knew paid a little more. When the company closed for good, um, how did you feel? And how did some of the people you worked with feel about the closure? Okay, I felt sad. I, um, that was approximately seven, eight years after I left. But I was under understanding that things were not going well there for several reasons. And uh, I felt sorry for my friends that had still worked there because some, there were people that had 20 or 30 years of time there that suddenly didn't, and they were maybe in their mid-40s or mid-50s and had the struggle to find uh, other work. Were they pretty successful? I mean, this was still a time that there were jobs in manufacturing? Yeah, most, my understanding, and I, and I knew these people that did find work in other plants in town or other type of, uh, for example, um, working with sheet metal, and then there was a lot of piping, a lot of plumbing work there too. Um, some of these people were able to get jobs with uh, heating, ventilating, air conditioning contractors or other sheet metal operations in town or other ma small manufacturing firms. So I think most of them were able to find work after when, they, when it was known that the plant was closing for sure. Is there anything you'd like to add that I didn't cover uh, so far? Uh, I don't think so. I think we covered it. Um, it was a great place to work when it was a great place to work. Um, people were, were good and the work was fun and um, the history, uh, the history of the place was always interested me in a great way. How so? Um, over a hundred years building fire engines and um, going from hand-drawn and horse-drawn fire engines to uh, these modern, well, it, well there was, a, if I, there was a, a poster in the front office that was, I think, a blown up from a trade journal that had a picture of a Pierce fire engine and some text and, in quotes, the uh, Cadillac of fire engines. And that was what we, we were always told that, that we were building the best, the best fire equipment in the country. There and was, the workers felt like they actually were. Oh, uh, yes, absolutely. Proud. Really did. Very, a lot of pride in the work. Um, and I do remember that as a lead man in that when I finished my part of the truck, and that could take anywhere from a couple months to several months, three, four, five months, depending on the, uh, there was one, <laughs> One truck, it was a large um, rear mount aerial, 100 foot aerial ladder truck. It was a Mac, a Mac cab and chassis. And there, that was one thing that changed too, is that from all Pierce cabs of the truck, and sometime, I think it was in the 70s, started using more, uh, a truck would come in like a Mac or a Ford or a GMC cab and chassis and frame, and then the rest of the truck would be built on there. But um, I remember someone, I think, from the city that I was working on a truck for saying that the, this truck was being built for parades as much as it was for firefighting, meaning that it had a lot of, a lot of detail and a lot of uh, shiny aluminum and stainless steel and so forth. So, so how much aluminum was actually uh, used on the trucks? You mentioned steel. Yeah, time. some oh, some of the trucks, the... Um, the steps, the running boards um, were of a tread plate design, kind of a diamond plate, a little thicker metal. And that could either be steel or that could be aluminum. So you have a sheet of aluminum tread or diamond plate that you would cut these pieces out. And the difference there when you use the steel tread plate, that was if you made a, a rear step as a large piece of the steel tread plate, that was the piece, but, but the aluminum being 
less strength, you had to put a, you, you built the aluminum step, but then you also had to build a backing step out of uh, either 12 gauge or 10 gauge uh, steel that would support that. But the, the aluminum, the trucks with the aluminum running boards and steps and, and uh, they're, they're really pretty. That was really a pretty fancy uh, ad addition to that vehicle. Well, thank you, Bob. Thank you, Carl.